from having a record-breaking era store to attending the Super Bowl and winning her fourth album of the year, I think it's safe to say that Taylor Swift has had a crazy year. And all of it, pretty much, has been tied together by her 10th album, Midnight's. But now, as she is finishing up her concerts in Singapore, the Midnight's era is coming to a close because the next time she'll be performing, her new album, The Tortured Poets Department, will have already been released. Yeah! So, as a massive Swifty and a huge fan of books, I decided that I would create a list of books for you that have similar themes and messaging as Midnight so that you have something to read for this next month before we get the Tortured Poets Department. I really hope you give these four books a try and don't forget to like and subscribe! When introducing this record, Taylor said she wanted to explore 13 sleepless nights throughout her life. In Maroon, she sings about dancing with and losing her love in New York. On Glitch, she reminisces on a friendship that turned into something more. And in Labyrinth, she sings of the anxieties she feels when realizing she has feelings for someone as a public figure and what that entails. What separates Midnight's from her previous records is that despite still being quite diaristic, a lot of the meanings are actually obscured by these complex metaphors. For example, when on Labyrinth she struggles to come to terms with her feelings, she describes them as being lost in the labyrinth of her mind. Instead of simply describing an argument like she did on Afterglow on the album Lover, here she evokes an image of her knuckles being bruised like violets as she uses her voice to depict a bloody battle in the Great War. And this idea of examining the past using metaphors is actually a huge part of one of my favorite books, and it's called In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. This book is a memoir about the author's past abusive lesbian relationship and how it has affected her as a Latina in America from the start to the end of the relationship. Other than that, it also involves some things about how these types of relationships were treated historically by the American system, the anxiety that she feels writing about this relationship in such a bad light because she doesn't want to give a bad rep to same-sex relationships and all these things are tied together by the fact that she uses this metaphor of a house and explores it through the different meanings it has in horror, fantasy, and the title references things like the Barbie dream house, how it's like this idealized place where it's basically all your dreams come true. But then she also later on ties into the horror trope of the house, which is often haunted and very isolating and what that means for her. And so every single chapter's title is the dream house as blank. And I think that her using and referencing all these tropes and stereotypes really elevated the writing of this novel. Now, moving on from this aspect of metaphors, but still kind of staying within the realm of her reminiscing on her past, a big part of Midnight's sees Taylor reflecting on her childhood, her past controversies, and loss. These songs aren't raw in the moment because these events have already passed her, so Taylor is now revisiting them with this new perspective, a more reflective perspective. In some songs, she really seems healed and supportive of her younger self, for example, on Your Own, Your Own Kid, she sings, You're on your own kid. Yeah, you can face this. You always have been. In others, she really brings this anger. For example, on What Have, Could Have, Should Have, she famously wails, Living for the thrill of hitting you where it hurts. Give me back my girlhood. It was mine first. This allegedly refers to an event from her past that featured quite heavily on her album Speak Now, but there is a definite change in attitude between Speak Now and Midnight's because on Speak Now, this was very raw and she sings with this hurt and you could even say guilt sometimes when referencing it. And that's a stark contrast to this anger that she feels here. She makes this question, does time actually heal you or are you just forced to change because of the different life experiences you acquire as you age? Is that healing or is it something else? And once again, one of my all-time favorite novels just so happens to explore a very similar idea. It's titled My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. It's a very provocative novel. Um, it's about this girl called Vanessa Y, and we follow her in two timelines. In the first timeline, she is 15 and she 
goes to high school and very quickly she develops a, a close relationship with her English teacher which slowly progresses to become almost Lolita-esque. In fact, this novel is very much in conversation with Lolita. And then we have the present timeline which occurs at the height of the Me Too movement where things about this English teacher have come to light and Vanessa has to question if she wants to go and speak what happened to her or if she's going to stay silent. Vanessa has to confront almost maybe for the first time in her life was her childhood a love story or was it something else? She says, I just really need it to be a love story, you know? I really, really need it to be that. And the entire time, Kate Elizabeth Russell wants us to question if Vanessa is healed. And if she isn't, then what is she? Moving on from that, Midnight's is filled with contrast. You have sunshine versus midnight rain, taking advice from someone who is falling apart, attempting to stay in a lavender haze despite your partner losing you. A lot of these seem to tie back to the two directions Taylor's life seemed to be pulled in. Going out and being bejeweled versus wanting that tranquility that she found in her sweet nothings. I mean, just look at the promotional photos that we got for Midnight's. She announced the album at the VMAs in a very bejeweled gemstone diamond dress and the cover really gave us glamour with that strong eyeshadow. But a lot of the photographs found inside the album were quite low-key, creating a dichotomy in the visual aesthetic of the album. In the record itself, Taylor often builds up both the glamorous and quite quiet lifestyles to be aspirational, but in real life, they often clash, especially if people in a relationship want these opposite things. For example, as she says, he wanted it comfortable, I wanted that pain. He wanted a bride, I was making my own name, chasing that fame, he stayed the same. Taylor emphasizes how people who once loved and cared for each other can grow apart if their goals stop aligning due, due to that contrast between glamour and quietitude. The book that I'd like to recommend you if this speaks to you is Cleopatra and Frankenstein by Coco Malores. Cleo is a 24-year-old immigrant to the US from Britain and she's an artist. She marries Frank who is 20 years older than her and despite loving each other, her wanting to get a green card is very much part of the reason why she married him. And the novel explores their relationship as their goals start shifting with time. It also looks at the greater New York scene through the eyes of um, their family and friends in each alternating chapter. Within the story, we examine the two sides of New York, both the tranquility of Central Park versus the club scene that happens at night. And we see how the, these two sides in influence the character's mental stability and art and lifestyle. The clash between the two often creates friction and sometimes can even be explosive. This is fine. This is a very thoughtful book and the characters are unforgettable, so I highly recommend. The last theme that I like to talk about is what we Swifties like to call Tay Voodoo. Or in other words, the tendency for people who wrong Taylor Swift to suddenly have their careers take a massive dive. I mean, just look at Scooter Braun and the mass exodus of artists leaving his production company a couple months after Vigilante shit was dropped. Or how Katy Perry's career took a dive after Bad Blood. But karma can work both ways, right? And a lot of things that Taylor Swift touches just happen to become gold. I mean, whether it's Camila Cabello coming out of Fifth Harmony and having a smash hit with Havana, or Jack Antonoff skyrocketing to become the top producer after he worked with her on Out of the Woods, Reputation, and so forth. She elaborates a bit more about this when she sings on Mastermind, no one wanted to play with me as a little kid, so I've been scheming like a criminal ever since to make them love me and make it seem effortless. This is the first time I felt the need to confess, and I swear I'm only cryptic and Machiavellian because I care. I told you none of it was accidental. And she has. She's kept a very tidy image for most of her career, often setting herself up as the underdog for us to root for. Whenever someone hates on her, they eventually get struck down by the Tay Voodoo. That's just how it works. While well, she keeps rising and rising. I mean, she somehow managed to get her new album, um, the Tortured Poets Department to outsell the record-breaking Midnight's in a day. A day. Like, that's so insane. 
Nice. This idea of karma coming back around, planning her triumph and the destruction of her enemies and keeping all of it a little secret that you can never confess to is a huge part of the controversial Verity by Colleen Hoover. Yes, yes, I know I'm recommending a Colleen Hoover book, but hear me out. If the other books on this list intimidate you, I'd say give this one a try. Colleen Hoover's strength is that she writes very easy to follow plots with a very addicting writing style. Like, I have to say, if ever I'm in a reading slump, I'll reach for Colleen Hoover because I know that I'll read it in a day and then I'll want to read something more. She's not my favorite author, but she gets the job done. But what is Verity actually about? Well, it's about this girl, Lowen Ashley, who is an up and coming writer. And she is chosen to complete a book series by the famous author Verity Crawford. Verity recently had been in an accident, which was very debilitating. And now her husband must take care of her. But since the fans were promised a conclusion to the series, her husband Jeremy took it upon himself to find an author that could complete the series. Of course, based on Verity's outlines and notes. Lowen ends up being taken to the Crawford estate to meet the author, examine her outlines, and start working. Get your fucking ass up and work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. You That's have to, so true. You have but very quickly things start turning a bit creepy, especially when she, found, when she finds a secret autobiographical manuscript written by Verity that reveals some really messed up things that were happening leading up to the accident. A lot of this book deals with trying to uncover the secrets of the accident and what actually is going on in the Crawford family. All characters have their secret little agendas and they're just hoping for that good karma to come to them, but can they keep their sides of the street clean? I don't know. Anyways, those are my four recommendations based off of Midnight's, and I actually want to do this for all of her albums, so if you have any suggestions for recommendations for all the other albums, please let me know in the comments. If you have other suggestions for Midnight's, um, for maybe individual songs or whatever, also put those in the comments and I'll, sure, I'll be sure to look them over. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm so excited for the Tortured Poets department, especially since the entire Tortured Poets thing really speaks to me. But yeah, that's all from me. I'll see you soon.